It's Game Boy World, and this is a game that never should have been. Well, the series has made it all the way to episode... 69, dudes! <laughs> Alright, glad to have gotten that out of the way. Our current topic, however, sits basically at the aphelion of any innuendo the episode number might suggest. There's nothing salacious, or indeed, even slightly enticing about this game, Pony Canyon's Tasmania Story. In the course of a series like this, charting the full library of a game system that kind of lurked in the obscure corners of an old and largely forgotten slice of video game history, we have and will come across a lot of pretty weird games. Yet yeah, Tasmania Story may actually be the weirdest so far, a game defined by unlikely choices and somewhat confusing outcomes. To begin with, it's based on a movie. That's nothing new, of course. We've seen licensed properties before, including anime like Fist of the North Star and Lupin the Third, toys like Zoids and Gundam, classic characters like Popeye, Snoopy, and Bugs Bunny, and comic heroes Spider-Man and Batman. In fact, like Batman the video game, Tasmania Story is based on a single movie rather than a general license. Unlike Batman, however, Tasmania Story doesn't share an attachment to some global blockbuster, some big-budget Hollywood summer marquee title. No, Tasmania Story is based on Tasmania Story, or rather, Tasmania Monogatari, a 1990 film released only in Japan. Not a whole lot of information about Tasmania Monogatari exists in the English-language portions of the internet, but in brief, the movie appears to have been a heartwarming family film about a boy and his father and their quest to thwart corporate real estate developers by discovering a rare Tasmanian tiger or something. It's a little bit footloose, a little bit ABC after school special, and as with most live action Japanese family films of the era, it clearly was produced on a budget at the after school specials end of the spectrum. For some bizarre reason, publisher Pony Canyon looked to this movie and said, yes, we want to make a game about this talky family drama. To this point, Pony Canyon has mostly licensed others' game properties for Game Boy, Sokoban, Penguin Land. So licensing a film property instead is a change for them. The question is, why this film? I mean, yes, there's a legal connection. Pony Canyon is a subsidiary of Fuji TV, which released the movie in the first place, but still, it's strange. Even more curiously, Pony Canyon ended up releasing the game in the US under its FCI label, despite the fact that Tasmania Monogatari has never seen an English language release. There's no sign of a film connection in the US game, which features a rather hideously drawn child riding a cartoon Tasmanian tiger rather than the production still of the Japanese box, but on the other hand, they didn't bother to rename it either. So, it's strange. But how do you adapt a family film in the 80s tradition into a handheld video game, you may wonder? Pony Canyon's solution to the question was, you adapt an old computer game into a completely unrelated action game. Tasmania Story turns out to be nothing more than a reskin of Pony Canyon's own 1984 release, Fruit Panic. Now, if you've never heard of that game, don't fruit panic. It evidently was released only in Europe and Japan on MSX and PC-8801. I say evidently because, much like the film Tasmania Monogatari, there's not much information available on Fruit Panic in the English-speaking web, besides a record of its existence. Even that little info leaves something to be desired. I can't seem to find a consensus on the game's true origins. Some sources claim it originated in the arcades, but other trustworthy resources, like the Arcade Museum, have no record of any coin-op version ever. It's just one of those forgotten games that no one can be arsed to research. Including me, I suppose. And little wonder, Fruit Panic was just one of the early 80s seemingly infinite array of uninspired Pac-Man knockoffs. Probably the most noteworthy thing about the game was that it was remade as Tasmania Story. To its credit, as Pac-Man clones go, Fruit Panic was at least mildly ambitious. It only really stole the character's design and ravenous hunger from Pac-Man. The rest of the game was swiped wholesale from a completely different classic Namco arcade game, Mappy. And I suppose there's a bit of Bomb Jack in there too, for whatever that's worth. The only consistent credit attached to Fruit Panic is its programmer, one Makoto Ichi no Seki, whose name appears on numerous Pony Canyon conversions up into the 90s. It's entirely possible that Ichi no Seki was the game's designer as well as programmer, the two roles were often synonymous on computer games of that vintage, but I can't find a clear answer to that online. Anyway, that's the game Pony Canyon looked to when it put together Tasmania Story. I guess it makes logistical sense. We've seen no shortage of vintage computer conversions on Game Boy, and the company probably figured they might as well get some use out of their dusty old MSX Mappy clone before it was too late. I'm not sure they pulled it off, though. Getting use out of the game before it was too late, I mean. 
Tasmania story feels painfully slight even by early Game Boy standards, a threadbare excuse for a standalone release in the year of our Lord 1990. It's a single screen action arcade game that offers a whopping two play modes, slow and fast. The action plays out across a mere 10 levels, though I suppose that's enough. It's a ridiculously difficult game, and I'll be buggered if I can make it past the fourth stage. Note that I say difficult rather than challenging, because honestly, I find the word challenging suggests a certain degree of fairness and appeal, something painfully lacking in Tasmania Story. Most of Tasmania Story's difficulty comes from its poor controls. It plays at a lightning pace, but its unresponsive input would be better suited to a methodical puzzler like Heiankyo Alien. Actually, the only Game Boy release we've seen with controls this sluggish has been Pony Canyon's own Boxel. Maybe the company recycled some of Atelier Double's code, or maybe they just couldn't figure out how to make a snappy, responsive Game Boy title, period. Whatever the case, Tasmania Story wants to be mappy, but it responds to players' commands less like that Namco classic and more like a coma patient. The protagonist moves one tile at a time and the window for inputting directional changes is incredibly slim, so clearing each stage would be a task even if you weren't being chased by relentless monsters the entire time. Your goal in Tasmania Story is to collect all the items littered throughout the stage without being gobbled by monsters. Each stage is divided into five platforms, with trampolines flanking the central platforms. As in Mappy, you can drop off a platform onto a trampoline and go sailing through the air, pressing the controller to the side in order to reach a different level of the stage. Unlike in Mappy though, these controls are insanely fussy, meaning that simply stepping onto your intended floor feels like a Herculean effort. The only difference between each of the ten stages comes in how the central platforms are divided. Gaps appear in the floors at odd intervals, varying by stage, as well as the nature of the sprites you collect and avoid. Otherwise, it's exactly the same each time, livened up only by the random appearance of collectibles, like a koala bear, at the edges of the screen. The odd, unfortunate little blackface kid you control has to gather his pickups while avoiding collision with four monsters that pursue him relentlessly. And this might not be entirely terrible, if only the rules surrounding them felt more consistent. But alas, it's a Pony Canyon game, so everything here seems totally haphazard. Monsters will kill you if so much as a single pixel of their sprite touches yours, unless you're on a trampoline, in which case you'll pass through the monster harmlessly. Usually. Sometimes you can die on a trampoline for some reason. And sometimes you can drop from above and kill a critter, though sometimes you'll pass harmlessly through it instead. The controls and collisions don't feel particularly consistent or well thought out. So, badly programmed game, based on an old game that felt primitive and derivative even when it was new, attached to a movie that no one in America had ever seen. Yes, it's another video game home run from Pony Canyon and FCI. Tasmania Story didn't have to be a lousy game. It's simple, yeah, but simple works on Game Boy. Unfortunately, Tasmania Story is simple and poorly made, and that doesn't cut muster. Something like this might have been borderline tolerable at the very outset of the Game Boy's life, but more than a year in, we've seen entirely too many examples of how much love and care can be invested into even a simplistic arcade concept. In a world where Data East's wonderful lock and chase exists, there's no room for the likes of Tasmania Story. Really the only redeeming feature Tasmania Story has to offer is its title screen, which offers a rare example of multiplane scrolling on Game Boy. You don't need to own the game to enjoy that though. Here. Hey, I just saved you 12 bucks. You're welcome. Next time on Game Boy World, Mario returns at last to Game Boy, and this time he has a medical degree. <laughs>